So there we are. So this is the fellowship of the link call for Wednesday, August 16, 2023. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess we started talking a bit about like uh, yeah some interactions, but uh, um, I guess I don't know if uh, Peter is gonna uh, join us. Later. No, no idea if Pete will be here. Um, yeah. and, and Pete and I talked a little bit um, last week, and one of the things that sort of crossed our path was seeing if we could have you explain Agora to us uh, differently, better, so we understand sort of how it fits other kinds of things, or how it's different from other yeah. kinds of things, or or stuff like cool. that, because we don't. We don't have it fixed in our heads quite well yet. <laughs> that happens a lot. Well, yeah, yes. I mean, I, I will be glad to do that. And uh, well, it's great uh, be here because uh, uh, um, um, I think uh, we have been developing, you know, the other concept in different directions, sometimes converging and experimenting with things. Uh, so yeah, we could do that anytime. Actually, I mean, uh, it's also like a, it is a, a heavy overloading <laughs> in our space. You know, like uh, also as a result of experimentation and you know, like changes and like, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it, will, it seems like a great idea to just have a checkpoint and maybe try to present like a more coherent uh, narrative of what it is and what it could be. Yeah, that'd be great. We'd love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And we've got Aram. Hey, Aram. Aram is still making his way here somehow. Yeah, I'm always. There we go. Uh, um, can you hear us? Is Jitsi giving more of us, more of us trouble more of the time? I feel like it is. Can you can you, you can hear me now, yeah. right? Where you find yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll get my camera on in a second. I just need to finish up a conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still better than Big Blue Button. Uh, in the space of like uh, open source video conferencing, in my particular uh, taste. Uh, <laughs> and then Google Meet, we don't like because. Well, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, uh, because it's a Google property. And how do you record calls in Meet? Does, I, that's not built in, is it? You have to pay for it. I mean, it's fine. I guess we pay for stuff, for stuff sometimes. Uh, but um, I, did, I do believe we should make it, I mean, as in we will meet, should make it a bit, uh, to put in my will meet hat for a minute on, uh, we should make it easier yeah. to be able to say like, because it's not like you can record and say like, oh, unlock this, pay five bucks. No, it's a bit more involved. Oh, interesting. You have to basically go and be in workspace or what? Yeah. You need to have a, a, a workspace account and like have the rice queue. So yeah. Uh, yeah. This reminds me we should fix that. <laughs> so maybe maybe yeah. tomorrow. Well, whoever whoever's in charge of Google's communication software is not the best software de designer. Well, I know the people and they rate. This is the thing. I mean, I don't want to like do too much, but this is where like you talk about any any other person pretty much and you are like, this person is great. But then so, somehow the result I, I can get behind this assertion is very unclear sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, it takes you, yeah. But maybe maybe I will <laughs> maybe tomorrow it starts. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think what winds up happening maybe is that executives fight over these things and then those fights don't turn into good design because they're political, not logical, or something like that. Uh, I don't know. It, yeah, just... I think it happens a lot in companies in general, like yeah. the org or and so on. Yeah. But you know, meet the meet or I mean I'm biased, but the meet is it's actually quite good, I think. Yeah. I mean and I'm not saying these because yeah, no, really. <laughs> um, so yeah, but the go I think I'll GC for now, yes, uh, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Maybe um fixed. and so uh, any other any other topics in your head for, for fellowship kind of topics? Um well, I mean, I have some like uh, precisely Agora related uh, surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like, but so I, I yield. Uh, so I, I, what what else is there out there? Adam, uh, B, is there Adam is finishing up a conversation, so he, I think he'll oh, sort of join us in a sec. He just said yeah. he had a call to finish up. Oh, I did, yeah. And V, I'd love to know like what your passion is, or you know, anything you'd like to. Yeah, share? I like federated stuff. I I was building like federated social systems back in like 2010, so like. <laughs> I have a pretty long history of that kind of stuff. Awesome, awesome. And where are you located on the planet? 
I mean, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, right. So you're my neighbor. Oh, where where are yeah. you located I'm at? In, I'm in the Pearl, 14th and Lovejoy. Oh, so yeah, I'm downtown. <laughs> We're literally like probably blocks yeah. from each other. Yeah, exactly. We could walk. That's very funny. So today, today's the last day of our heat wave, probably. Oh, yeah, that's been, oh, wow, that's been something. Not as bad as 2021, the heat dome. That was kind of crazy. This mm -hmm. one this one just feels like an average day in Phoenix. Mm. Uh, and I, I did not move to Phoenix on purpose, so I'm not, <laughs> not crazy about really hot weather. But but the heat dome was crazy. I, the, the heat dome, I remember it being 116 outside, and I would step outside, and it felt like you were stepping into a convection oven. You would just suddenly get like a, a, a blast of, of heat off the pavement. Hey, Michael. Mm -hmm. I, we, uh, v and I just realized that we are neighbors in Portland. And V is a collaborator of Flancians in the Agora project. Yes. Cool. Uh, Aram is finishing up a call and will be with us shortly. How are you? I'm OK. Um, yeah. Are you in Brooklyn right now? I'm in Putnam Valley. Oh. Putnam Valley, New York. North. All the New York Valleys sound picturesque just when you say their names. I know, I know. It's just that, you know, that colonialist, quaint. I am, I am on the confiscated lands of the Wappingers, and, you know, hmm. they're all gone, and we white folk have it all to ourselves. Sorry. Hmm. <laughs> to bring it really down. Ah, <laughs> it is rude to remember, for sure. Yeah. What's that? It is, I, I will think to remember, yes. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. To remind us of, yeah. I was, I was um, trying to hold some conversations around identity recently. Not trying, we had a good conversation, but I find there's sort of two different angles on this. One angle is that um, wokeness and identity politics seem to be the flame that the far right is fueling in order to get its base activated and you know wake things up. And there's a tremendous hatred of, of wokeness that DeSantis exemplifies perfectly that is carrying over to the left. I was, I, I, a couple months ago, I was at a weekend thing surrounded by mostly progressive people. Whoa, don't know what that was. It wasn't me, I don't think. No, it was me. It was that, the machine. Oh, 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 right, right. oh, okay, yeah. It was the machine that goes ping. Yeah, yeah, no, it was me getting attacked. But that was really the, like a wake you oh, up was, kind of ping. Yeah, yeah. That was amazing. Apologies for that. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's the so there's that the whole uh, woke, and I was surprised at how polluted the term woke had become for progressives, which worried me because to me it's just like hey, and and I, I facilitated a conversation a couple months ago, a separate conversation, where I said like woke is just being aware that other people have suffered huge injustices and maybe trying to do something about it. But it's, it's just like recognizing that that even happened to other people. Woke is mm -hmm. not their attempt to take over society and diminish like white culture, any of that kind of crap. That got freighted onto mm -hmm. it because it's such a dangerous idea. And then yeah, so I mean, the definition of woke that, I mean, if you if you think about like the pre previous definition of woke, it's just like being awake, paying attention, perceiving what's going on. Oh, yeah. that happened. Oh, you know, that person is not, you know, equally privileged to me or that person mm -hmm. used yeah. to live on this land or whatever it is, you know, it's not like, it doesn't even say you're supposed to act on it. It just says you're supposed to be awake to it um, and aware. And so like, it seems like the counter argument needs to be characterized as a sleepness or, you know, blinderedness or something like that. You know, I mean, there's, there's no counterpart mm -hmm. So what, you know, where, what we can call the people on the right who are refusing to acknowledge the things that one should be awake to, aware of. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, right, like, it, it, there is a very successful methodology that's being employed oh, yeah. here that has been employed more than once before, which is the conservative media movement has the capability to redefine words um, and do so successfully. And we saw it happen with the word liberal, um, like back in the Bush era. Yep. And now they have they have successfully done it with woke, um, right? Like 
the point that we're even having a discussion on like the concept of wokeness shows that like they've taken a thing that is a known definition and turned it into an entirely different definition. I'm not sure how known it was. I don't think enough people were aware of the simple basic definition so that when it got repurposed and turned back on itself, it was there to be done. Well, I think the people who used it and needed it knew what it was. Yes, but that was It's the same thing with, right, but that was fine. Yeah. It's the same thing with like critical race theory. It's right. a and fairly academia. obscure piece of terminology from legal academia um, that was just recreated into something else entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, it is one of the reasons why like I got so interested in the Context Center project that I'm working on to begin with, to bring mm -hmm. it back to our organizing cool. things, right? Like. The idea of providing sources about a thing and then also providing timelines about a thing um, allows you to try and, or in theory, my hope is, allows you to reverse context class, mm -hmm. right? That's the goal. <laughs> um, I think like yeah. in a lot of ways, when we talk about what we try, we're trying to do within the, the fellowship of the link, right? Like the idea of providing that linking process and having it informative and shared and providing basis for understanding similar terms or the same term shared amongst people is like conceptually the idea of reversing context collapse. And like, I don't even necessarily agree with like context collapse in the more broad sense it's used, mm -hmm. but like basically without going into the definition of context collapse, because I think we all have like a basic understanding of what people mean when they say context. Well, do we maybe assuming we do is part of what produces it. This so is I guess, true. Yeah. I mean, but uh, uh, you put it very well. And I think, um, um, uh, thank you for reminding me of that concept, which, uh, you know, I had not allowed, but like, uh, and I was, I was thinking about how to, you know, we started the call, uh, maybe talking a bit about, you know, trying to reframe or like maybe explore what you know, I bring up the hour often and what the hour is about in the end. And I think it's very, very, pretty much this that you said. Uh, so essentially like a, a, a set of, not even tools, I mean, tools in practice, but um, uh, at the, at this, as it's called maybe a protocol, a set of conventions for, uh, for tackling this essentially. And, uh, for federating ideas, maybe, and definitions, uh, or, or reducing friction so, you, you know, we can identify, you know, uh, intersection, intersections, you know, like a, a convergence, and also um, a, 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 the, the points in which we don't converge, which are even, I, I, I will think about this, about, you know, very often here, I love these calls, but you know that like we share so much. This uh, interesting, like uh, linking things in, you know, like in like uh, maybe um, uh, federating in um, sometimes pushing back against like you know um, uh, World Garden, for example. I mean, there's different directions, but we share a lot. I always think, what is, uh, what are the things we don't agree on? Uh, right. Great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, and to some extent. Uh, Maybe I mean uh, they, they are both very interesting. Clearly, one is like one is a yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Santiago. So, so two different questions that are maybe related. One, um, how might we prevent context collapse and the kinds of stuff that we're talking about here? Like, I'm I'm interested in these things. Uh, maybe Aram exactly as you are. Like, what do you do to prevent that from happening so that we can actually have reasonable discourse and so forth? And then, Flancia, to your question right now. Hey, what what are some useful ways of exploring our boundary spaces so that mm -hmm. we can understand where we do disagree and, and in, in what ways? And, and I'm really interested in the space between us as a place to put what we know and what we believe, so that we can compare notes. So mm -hmm. that you know, so that the agora and uh, uh, mem and the brain and kumu can all be sort of visible together as some kind of representation of what we believe. Um, because I think that's important and that might just be me. Completely. This conversation reminds me of, I don't know if you all are familiar with like dialectics and I feel like the agro could be a place for like synthesis, antithesis, and then, I mean, mm -hmm. th 
thesis, antithesis, and in synthesis, where you have opposite opposing views, and then the truth is somewhere in the middle of those views. That's very, very nice to put. Yeah. Um, so like a Hegelian dialectic is sort of what you're describing, I think. And I don't know much about Hegel, couldn't, couldn't describe him to anybody, but there's lots of people who are big fans of, of that method. So that could be a good thing. And I think there's some tools that try to do that. There's tools in the world that, that there's certainly a, a whole series of debate um, format tools. There's a thing called argumentation theory uh, that was developed by a professor at Northwestern, I think named Stephen Tolman, and which he's got, here's a claim, here are arguments pro and con, and there's a, there's a way of modeling an argument. Um, and I don't know the relationship between Hegelian dialectic and argumentation theory. That would be a really interesting question to ask GPT, for example. Um, it would. I mean, I think it would. I think like the easy answers that they are opposed, like the idea of dialectics is that you take opposing ideas and unify them into some sort of single like conceit that you can deal with. It, it's to collapse the binaries uh, that come out of like something like debate or mm -hmm. I don't know argumentation theory at all, but what, what it sounds like, which is an argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, well, argumentation theory um, is more about the, the the structure of the argument uh, in that in the sense. So, huh, it's very interesting. No, it isn't. <laughs> Did you pay for the five minute argument? <laughs> exactly. I'm glad somebody got my reference. Yeah. Uh, Um, so, I mean, uh, and here's where, like, I guess through the time uh, we've been discussing, you know, approaches to what we want to do together. Also, what is it exactly we want to do together and so on, uh, beyond having these very silly conversations, you know. Um, I, I guess I keep going back to this, this key terms, right? Like, uh, it, maybe like this idea of defining a shared vocabulary uh, and shared tools. Uh, share, share concept precisely, and more generally, like a way to resolve what we all mean when we say X. That, that to me seems to be like the, the requisite, I guess, for a community to sort of work, maybe, uh, like longer term, but I don't know. I, I think most communities do it maybe informally, and, and maybe one of the hypotheses behind the Agora, as it could be, you know, as it is now, you know, uh, very limited, is that, you know, a community that uh, agreed uh, on, a, on a commons, to, uh, to work within by default, not exclusively, but by default, will have some competitive advantage to put it some way. That, that will reduce fiction, yes. So it feels just instinctively to me like most communities or groups that are semi-functional um, aren't as explicit about the things you just said. Uh, mm -hmm. They work much more messily. They, they, don't, yes. they don't agree on terms or figure out their discourse on terms. They don't map out the commons and think explicitly about how to feed the commons. They're just messing around trying to figure out legislation or rules or what project to do next or whatever. And along the way, they, they have like grinding problems because they misunderstand each other and they sort of sort them out and then set them aside. And it's, I think it's rare to find a community that is sort of yes. more, has more clarity about the things you just said so that the things you just offered feel to me like potential tools for resolving those problems. Like, hey, let's learn what a commons is. Let's learn how commons are governed. Let's learn which commons we touch. And then let's figure out how we want to act about those commons together, which is one of my huge arguments against libertarianism. Because it feels to me like the thing libertarianism forgets and doesn't seem to understand how to do is manage commons. Like libertarianism sure. just wants to split them up, make them all privately owned, and then right. uh, maximize profits off of them somehow. I don't know. Yeah, include them as a solution. Yeah. Um, so, well, so I think. The, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think like the thing is that communities thrive when there is a degree of gray area in their definitions because it allows people to join together towards common cause without 
having to match explicit definitions. The problems occur when the gray area in the definition grows too large. Uh, and then people are talking about fundamentally different things. That makes sense to me. One of the interesting things I've noticed is through usage of the agora is that since every person has their own little entry essentially underneath the definition, you can kind of see just by looking at it, like who has uh, agreeing ideas and who has opposing ideas without necessarily having any conversation between those ideas. Interesting. And I'm not sure without seeing how that operationalizes in Agora, what, what exactly you mean, but I have a general idea. Well, are you familiar with like Urban Dictionary? Sure. So it, it's similar to Ur Urban Dictionary is where you'll have like an entry and then how like on Urban Dictionary, each user has their own definition. And then you can see on that definition what each user's entry is, uh -huh. and you can compare and contrast that. It's very similar, except it's more of an academic context rather than like an urban dictionary kind of context. But like the concept, I feel, is, to me personally, is pretty similar. I like that. That was a really nice analogy. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm I'm trying to write a short I'm trying to write a short essay about your back. Um, trying to write a short essay about how technology affects citizenship or, you know, being good citizens together. And I, I got myself tangled up in my shorts because I have so many negative things to say. And the goal of this short essay is to be kind of positive. So I'm, this, this conversation is actually helping me think through some of it. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I think the, I think the thing is like, this gets back to sort of what we are trying to do in some ways, right? Like, I think the thing because become that to the point of like how we define things and like the idea of something like urban dictionary, right? Mm -hmm. Like in search, when you use search as we conceive it, Google search for an answer, you get a libertarian concept of finding an answer, which is different things compete to be the best answer as defined by a bunch of signals that Google has decided. Um, and then one of them is on top and that is the answer. But I think what we're talking about is that it's not, like that's not how thought or like getting answers works really, right? The, the, there's more than one answer to the question and you need to be able to understand them like as a group. Makes great sense. Uh, v, like you have your hand up? Um, so yeah, this makes me think of one thing we're working on that's in progress with the agro that's not really fleshed out yet completely is contextual ranking. So you rank something personally like that you think is in the agro is like more re relevant to your context. And then that will federate to your, your social network, to your friends or whatever. And then it will affect their ranking. So when they look at it, it's in, con in context of your personal social network rather than some global like corporate viewpoint of like what is relevant in that context. And I'm trying to remember this idea of cultural or community low, um, proximity or you know uh, having its own set of contexts. I could have, it rings a very faint bell from either research or apps that I've seen in the past where somebody was trying to figure out how to do some of that, but I'm not remembering it right now. Um, and, and some text analysis that compares different communities use of the same terms and shows how they're different would be really useful um, yeah. and would highlight the kind of spin and you know, word jujitsu that Aram, you were talking about earlier. And, you know, David Frum is one of the world's experts in how do you, how do you take over words? Uh, he's been a Republican strategist for like three decades, at least. <clears throat> um, um, so, sorry, I lost a lot of context precisely because of like this uh, hiccup. Um, but um, I guess going back to the uh, to this um, idea about 
So what? Uh, yeah, I really like how you put it, Adam, on you know the libertarian concept of uh, of search and this individualistic approach, sort of like like a, like a zero sum game, right? like competition for for like uh, scarce clicks and so on. I guess it's very interesting. I guess to think further, you know, like we offer that possibility of like you know, say ranking, uh, which is community owned. I think that's definitely very promising. It's also uh, promising for like things like the Fediverse, you know, like uh, activity by being so so um, so flexible. I don't know if it's uh, it's flexible enough, but you know, you could imagine. And this is where like I'm sort of frustrated that the Fediverse seems averse to search and crawling by default <laughs> quite a bit. But like you know, it just seems like an amazing platform for for trying different precisely this like it's very search again in a social context and so on. I guess I wonder also which other alternative we have. I guess I'm thinking, you know, like the so I guess what I dream when I search is like, uh, and this is what I've been you know we've been trying to like sometimes prototype with Agora is seeing first always Wikipedia because I love Wikipedia. So you know, if there's a Wikipedia article, I never essentially Wikipedia I never not I don't want it to be up top. So this is why it's always at the top of the hour. And the same for any sites, you know, you could say, a community could say, and I think Kagi Search also does this uh, as a commercial offering, is like you can pin sites, so they will always show up top if they have something relevant. But you know, like essentially we can re replicate that um, uh, as a community. And 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 the, the community aspect, I think, makes it so, you know, all this <laughs> customization we have, we can share and they can compose, right? The idea being that we can, Maybe I can see. I will be happy to like search the web and, and see it as as a, any of you uh, sees it. Sort of like opting into like a conscious filter bubble to some extent. That is very explicit and you know easy to opt out of and so on, but uh, uh, potentially useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, a small. This is. Oh. Go ahead, Michael. Just going to say. I mean, this is. And Jerry, you were sort of asking the question of like where you've heard this, this is the, in a way, I mean, I think the trust network model of, um, you know, contextualizing everything that you see consensually by, um, by, you know, there's a, there's a liquid democracy, potential liquid democracy aspect to it too, that you, you know, delegate your filtering on such and such a subject to the aggregate of these people you know and trust and it's different for a different subject and so to the extent that you're creating a filter bubble it's very conscious and if your your default is uncolored by somebody else's out, out algorithm i mean it seems to me the place that you want to start i mean i know that um you know brad de graphs um, efforts right now around um, green check. I don't know if you if you know Brad or if you're familiar with that. I know you do, Jerry. Yeah. Um, but um, but and yeah, I, I know there are other people kind of working on that. But I mean, owning your owning your social graph, <laughs> and um, wouldn't that be nice? And uh, and being able to you know denote your your trust. In other people on certain subjects for yourself um, allows, you know, allows to make things that you're talking about to happen and, and do what you're talking about. Um, let me link to what Brad. Uh, yeah, thank you. Because the green check stuff, okay. I don't know much about. Thank you. And this is all the, uh, another direction I, uh, I guess I've discussed with uh, Samuel. He's not here today, so I will just drop this thing of perhaps this uh, something he could bring up is the, you know, the wiki search. <laughs> Nothing like searching wiki, but like, you know, uh, wiki like tools as um, a complementary to search. Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, like the same as having Wikipedia at the top of the results, having like a wiki um, you know, comment on some queries, again, shared by a community. This is sort of like, uh, of course, again, going in the direction of what the hour I trying to explore, which is, you know, seeing first what your friends or community has written about something before you move on to the greater web, essentially. Yeah. 
Yeah. Interesting. I, just to rewind for a sec, I have not heard the term liquid democracy before. Mm. Oh, uh, it's a great one. Yeah, it's, it's a great one. <laughs> uh, so our friend, um, uh, hold on, uh, David uh, Boville was part of a liquid democracy kind of movement in Germany back some years ago. So he would know a lot about it. I mean, it's, it, uh, I think there's, um, there are other terms. I'm trying I, I know that Colorado is doing an experiment with, it, it's, it's sort of delegated authority. And I think there are other terms for it. Well, there are uh, tons. Yeah. But, there's, there's, yeah. there's basically uh, sort of delegative, uh, methods of democracy. There's also, uh, Proxy, proxying in democracy. Uh, there's a bunch of other things. But I, I've always really liked the idea that if I find somebody I trust in some domain, I could proxy my vote or at least my opinion over toward mm -hmm. them. Um, that would be fantastic. And I don't know how far uh, liquid democracy has gotten. I mean, honestly, it's sort of the. Uh, it, it's really you know, putting, putting some traction on the urge that results in the retweet or re re post in the post Twitter era, um, you know, that rather than just saying, yeah, what he or she said, you know, you can, you can give your vote to that person on that subject and, and, up their clout um, and if you could actually do that in legislative contexts be kind of amazing mm -hmm. and, 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 and literally i think i think colorado is doing some stuff with mm. that and the notion that you can um prioritize uh issues such that rather than you know, saying red, blue, and all that comes along with it, there's, you know, more of a, well, you know, environmental issues are my primary concern. And I go this way on those subjects. And then I feel less strongly about, you know, whatever hot button issue. And it also, you know, helps get things away from circling back to the to the what what Aaron was talking about about you know how woke has been weaponized and how you know death panels and all the other things that mm -hmm. liberal um you know that that getting things out of the hot button flashpoint issues that divide you on one side or the other because those things become less of a priority like it's like i don't think anybody would say you know I care more about, you know, I care more about the rights of transgendered people than I do about the price of groceries or, you know, my kids' education mm -hmm. or whether we're in a war or not. But, Which is even the major. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, think like, mm -hmm. if I, if I may, I think like part of the, curse of american politics <laughs> is that it attempts to demand a hierarchy of priorities where most people do not form a hierarchy of priorities mm -hmm. uh they form like a mesh of priorities well it's a system we're, we're think... trying to describe but the voting technologies or methods don't support system thinking so you wind up trying to squish them down and you wind up trying to take an analytic framework where you separate one issue from the other when the issues are very deeply intertwined. Yeah, it's especially because like the brokenness of American politics in terms of the parties do not evenly represent actual political positions. Right. Uh, we only have two parties and they don't, they're, they're not actual like political parties. They represent groupings of interests. Um, and so like, as a result, you are driven into hierarchy of ideology because you realize that in your mesh of ideology, 
that mesh does not graph well onto one party or the other. Right. Um, and so therefore you must pick the hierarchy to decide which of the mesh of ideas is the one you use to decide who to vote for. But I mean, Aram, I'm curious, do you think that um, the, it's like it behooves, um, it behooves Republicans <clears throat> to make, you know, to center wokeness and elevate it in the, the campaign hierarchy to an extent that would go beyond where anyone would put it in their real hierarchy. Maybe I misunderstood you, but I, think, I thought I heard you saying it's sort of asking people to make a hierarchy um, when I, I mean, think people I, would make a hierarchy that wouldn't put that very high, but it's being centered by someone else. And likewise, you know, Democrats are wisely centering abortion on the Supreme Court and, you know, things. Right. Like I think it's not quite that. It's that the political parties in the media go out of their way to center particular ideas as the top ideas within their hierarchy of ideology. And then you must match your highest hierarchy of ideology idea priority to their hierarchy of idea priority, mm -hmm. right? So if the Republican Party creates a situation in which they present their hierarchy of ideas as wokeness being of the highest priority, then you have to look at your priority of ideas and say, okay, where is this on my hierarchy and does it matter to me enough that I would vote for it or against it. Uh, and that allows them to divide the populace, right? Because yeah. it doesn't matter if most of the population would actually agree with most of the things that Republicans who are against wokeness are about. If they can manufacture a concept of wokeness and say, this is a thing you should be angry about, the, it doesn't even matter that it, it, what the definition is, right? All they have to do is manufacture an item, put it on your hierarchy, and hike up, it up the hierarchy high enough that you would then vote for them about it, right? There is no... The important thing to note about, like, wokeness in politics right now is there is no policy, Right? Like, there is no policy position for being anti-woke. It's just, like, uh, it's just really a byword for where Republicans contextualize as smaller government, right? That's what they are trying to, yeah, I know it doesn't sound like it, right? But how does wokeness, how does anti-wokeness reveal itself in policy decisions? The answer is by shutting down government support for things that people want, right? Mm -hmm. Or programs that people want or support for DEI in corporate settings or any sort of interference with what the executive of corporations want to do that is perceived by the Republican party as somehow coming from some other stakeholder, right? The idea is to remove support for trans rights. It's to remove health care. It's to remove support for women's rights. All of this becomes bundled under wokeness. Um, and people might not realize that that is really what they are voting for. But the anti-wokeness policy position is remove government from um, the capacity to support societal change. Right. So, and societal change requires government support to occur. So if I may, I'm going to bundle a couple things here because I've been taking notes in the chat. Um, first, whoever yells louder shifts the stack for their people, the people who are listening to them. And unfortunately, shifts the stack also in public discourse because the press responds. And so so um, uh, so you see this happening all the time. And then does everybody know what Darvo means? Uh, let me put a link in for Darvo. Darvo is an incredibly useful uh, term. It means basically uh, turn, the, turn the abuse back on the abuser, or, or rather the abuser turning the abuse back on the victim. 
DARPA was incredibly important. So when Fannie uh, Willis convict, uh, indicts 19 people, including Giuliani, and the next day Giuliani says, this is a travesty, this is, this is the end of democracy, this is the overthrow of government as we know it, you could take all the words that he just said and say, oh, right, that is exactly what you and your colleagues are busy conspiring to do against the U.S. So they've taken, they've taken the accusation and flipped it so that it, in fact, is, the, is the, the people trying to pursue justice who are committing that crime. And DARVO is one of the many different techniques for winning these discourses in public spheres. DARVO is one of the things that makes it incredibly hard to police, govern, control, shape, uh, rein in any of these kinds of galloping, out of control kinds of, of breaks, break, breaks of discourse. Uh, so, so Darvo is really uh, good that way. And then, um, Aram, I, I don't know that this is a smaller government thing. I think that what's happened is woke has become a very nice proxy for racism, homophobia, and a whole bunch of programs that the far conservative right just wants to run, which turn into more legislation. They're busy passing laws to restrict our rights and women's rights and everybody's rights. This is not less government. This is, in fact, <clears throat> government poking its nose into people's households, which is what I thought conservatives were not, not into so much. But, but right, right. It's the it's the politics of, yeah. So when I say small government, I mean <clears throat> the withdrawal of government from the support of social endeavors, which is different from them attempting to restrict social endeavors. Right. That is still minimizing social endeavors. Yes. Yeah. So, right? the, so the it's, withdrawal of affirmative action, for example. Right. Right. And this is always what Republicans meant by small government, all the way back to the Southern strategy. Right. Like the idea is that when they say small government, what they mean is that the government withdraws its support for societal change. Thus, the definition of conservative applying to the conservative party, right? It's the recall back to older values. But I think it's interesting to see, uh, so Darvo, like conceptually, is then... It's interesting to see it applied there because when you apply that strategy to politics, that's just the description of fascist politics, mm -hmm. right? Like that that's how fascist politics works um, because you must both minimize your opposition and paint them as an enormous threat, exactly. right? Which is how you get this idea that like in Republican politics, the claim that gay people are an incredible minority, but also there's nothing more important than oppressing them. Or the same with trans people, right? right. Like that, that is signature like fascist behavior. Yep. Um, I'm really struck. I was in Berlin after the fall of the wall or at some point in the past, and I walked into a, a, a part of town where there were banners hanging from light posts. <clears throat> and, and the banner that I remember on one side, it had a chess piece. And then on the other side, it said in 1934-33, um, Germany passed a law saying Jews could not be members of chess clubs. And I'm like, that's exactly what happens. It's like the chess lobby is really small and isn't going to like try to endanger its life to protect Jewish members of the chess club. But then you just crank the volume up, right? You start you start someplace where there's no constituency, and then say, look, we've already got a, we've got already got a law now. We're just going to make it apply to everybody. Uh, thanks for the link to the Ur fascism essay. I did. I didn't have it in my brain, but I had mention of it. But now, I, now I get to go read it and digest yet another piece of clever text. Ah, uh, I'm dry. Yeah. I, I am. Dry. It is very useful. It I is am, a very useful processing tool. That essay. I am drowning in really good essays and videos and other sorts of things, which I faithfully try to dissolve and and you know digest into my brain, et cetera, et cetera. That that is a big reason why I don't get to the stuff that I, I'm supposed to be doing. Reading Club. Re what? Let's put it on a list. My proposal when I hear it kind of thing is like, let's start a Reading Club. So we all read a... I, and then do, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, so so my, my proposal like that is I call mm -hmm. it Five Minute Universities. Have you heard me talk about this? Um, so uh, we did, a, we did a, a one OGM call like this. The idea is... Um, there's a bunch of stuff that some of us are really care about and other people don't know very much about. So you get five minutes to explain whatever you know about this thing you really care about. 
and then we get five minutes to ask you questions. And then, then we bounce to the next one. So, so people volunteer to do a five minute university. It only goes 10 minutes. The th session only goes 10 minutes long. If you want to keep talking, grab that person at lunch or make a zoom date with them or whatever else. And so, um, I'll, I'll point to some in my, in, in the, you know, they've got cataloged in my brain and I've, I've po posted a couple of these that are unfortunately a little longer than five minutes. I think I ran about eight minutes on, on the, the ones that I really like. <clears throat> but the idea is to make them very compact and to try to compress what you really got from it. And my favorite one, and this is my, my YouTube video that's gotten the most views, is uh, about Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, back in 1944. Uh, I love how your cat is climbing up the couch there, Flancian. Super cool. Uh, and a bunch of people, what other people get from The Great Transformation is different from what I got from The Great Transformation. And so I, I recorded a video about that. And, and I hope it's useful, but I get a lot of really nice comments in the comment section still to this day about, hey, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, so, so if we help each other digest things and then just post them openly into the comments so that other people can get them, not just us on this little, uh, little jitsi call, that wins. Because then that, that builds. If ever, if ever, and, then, and then back to what V was saying sort of earlier uh, in the call, my difference of opinion about the great transformation and yours, Flancian or V's, can be seen, and then we can talk about that and tease out and together, like how that might work. That's kind of cool. Yeah, if we were to slice up this call, if, if we were to actually look back on our assets in these calls and call, call out and quickly curate the segments where we say stuff worth remembering, that would be pretty cool. I would love it. I mean, it does that. I, I sort of assume we are all doing this individually in our various note systems. And the real thing we need is a way to unify our note systems, which is what we regularly to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is a fraction, but, and this by the way, is, is in the in the Agora of the, of the link. Excellent. So this Thank is you. a link Agorai. I just loaded the page for Felicia of the link in the Agora of the link. And it usually almost hangs my browser. Uh, so it may hang your browser as well. You need uh, to give it a, a while uh, uh, just because of the amount of stuff it loads, which I think is kind of cool. But, you know, of course, like uh, not everybody thinks bugs are cool. But, you know, bugs are potential, uh, are, you know, of chaos. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, this is everything uh, we have of the feature of the link in Relate. It's still like loading. It's like it's jumping around. Wow. Eventually, it will converge. It's a like a lot. And this we have a mass over, you know, uh, well, this year and a half, I think. Um, I think the hour of plants may even have a bit more, uh, just because you know uh, uh, this hour of the link has a few, uh, um, um, some fewer repositories. But just like uh, touring it, if you, if you are interested. So it starts with like, you know, uh, this is just like a note on the link. The first one is actually a comment, a one-off comment on John Perry Bar Barlow, uh, which I uh, we made a song call and I just wrote down the name in a different note. So it showed up separate. I, so it always starts with uh, uh, John Perry Barlow, uh, which I sort of like. Um, then we have like my own notes on what it is and, you know, the founding document that uh, I, remember, I remember Samuel shared with, with me when he invited uh, me here before I met all of you. Um, and uh, here we start Relate. This is the page of Relate on the feature of the link. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have like the actual uh, um, uh, notes in a few. Um, uh, in a few uh, ways. Uh, so this is actually the, the notes we, uh, we have been taking. This is actually the, the notes from today, uh, already live, of course, and what we have so far. Um, it has a few uh, goodies on top of the regular note taking. Every time you mention uh, an Agora link or any link that we think uh, it's Agora like, it will just be transcluded uh, yeah. as for Ted Nelson. So for example, like we mentioned liquid democracy, so liquid democracy just shows up. Uh, for example, this this sub node on, on liquid democracy, you can click pull all, and all all the social media activity about liquid democracy just gets automatically transcluded. So it's sort of like uh, yes, so you can go recursive, but just like uh, scrolling, 
we have a, a, a lot here. Hmm. Uh, we discuss IPFS at some point. Here it is. Uh, we have uh, different documents uh, transcluded. We have uh, we discuss dog drop when Dan Whaley was here, mm -hmm. and essentially you can uh, scroll quite a lot, quite a lot, and uh, and like I said, like go oh, here we have like some spreadsheet. Uh, actually, the original spreadsheet for the uh, chart on tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is just like a, for me at least a nice reminder on maybe we can uh, follow up on that and maybe uh, see uh, where Matthew and yeah Matthew are. Matthew and Pete were working on that one last term. Yeah, yeah. So you know, like essentially, if nothing else, it's sort of like a. It looks like a list or like a website, but it's more like a tree. Right. It's like a yeah, yeah. it's like a kaleidoscope of notes that folds in on itself whenever it needs. Exactly. To. Exactly. So yeah, I mean this is a, a you know just something to play with if you want, and you know of course uh, you say like uh, as we are all also taking notes about these topics and so on, uh, we can just add uh, to this uh, aura of the link if you want whatever else uh, should be here, whichever other repository uh, you know we can uh, ingest. So then uh, essentially you know we can keep it growing. And at least use it as an index or a potentially um, a search engine for everything related to the fellowship. Very cool. Thank you. No, no, no. So what happens if you put a link to that page inside of our notes? The world, <laughs> yeah. the world collapses. <laughs> well, actually, I think I added a protection or I had to do for that, but it may just recurse infinitely. Uh, oh, the gate information. Thank you. I will uh, note it now. So, um, where does that bring yeah. us? It's it's kind of fun because it feels it feels like we <clears throat> strayed a bunch at the start at the top of the call. We were like going off in lots of different directions, and we came right back to the thing we care about and the thing we're, we're each sort of working on, which is lovely. Yeah, I think it makes sense. What about doing the five minute? Um, you call it a five minute university approach. Within within the goals, we can like maybe we can, yeah. We just have to pick topics and figure out what what kinds of things we want to do five minute use about, and then get volunteers who say yeah, I'll, I'll do that one, um, or or we'll come up with topics that they'd like to do. Yeah, um, easy enough to do. And and so a piece of it is five minute universities about other people's media. So the one I just yeah. shared is about Polanyi's book. And you know, uh, it'd be interesting to do a five-minute university on the on the Ur fascism essay by by Echo, for example. Um, but another way to do it is to just take some idea you have about something you'd like to see done in the world and do a five-minute university about that. Something that doesn't exist yet. That would be cool too. It'd be a more of a five-minute proposal or something like that. But we could we could sort of mix those in. We did an OGM call where we had three or four, I think we had four um, five minute universities in the hour. <clears throat> and that was plenty, like three was, a, it was sorry, in the 90 minute slot. And three provoked very nice conversation for the rest of the 90 minutes. So, <clears throat> so trying to do a full hour of, of six of them, because they the slots each take 10 minutes is probably too intense. Makes sense. Cool. Um, do you have like a write up of the concept somewhere? Yes, uh, I will share it right here. I put up a wiki on uh, my massive wiki page, I think. Let me just check to see if that link works. <laughs> and I have it linked next to Lightning Talks, of course. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and it's actually now. Thank you, Jerry. Oh, good. There we go. <laughs> so this is how it looks there. Yeah. Perfect. That was the page I wrote up to try to describe this before we did the OGM call on it. Very nice. And here is the OGM call. Here is a brain link to the OGM call where we did the five minute universities. 
Jerry, because yep. you, prob you probably know the answer to this question, um, where does highfalutin come from? I actually don't know. Uh, um, that's a great question. Mm. Compass are pretentious. Uh, many alternative spellings. Where's the etymology? Highfalutin? Yeah, highfalutin. Highfalutin. Etymology is disputed. It's, One theory is that it comes from the Yiddish word, hifalufalum, which means extravagant language or nonsense. Another theory is that it comes from high flown. It originated as U.S. slang in the early 19th century. It may have come from high fluting or high flying. <laughs> huh. None of those are that satisfying. High flying sort of makes sense to me, but maybe that's what makes it a full etymology. <laughs> And there's a real one. <laughs> yeah. Grammarist has a nice page on it, which I'm going to add to my brain now. I, I like that. Um, uh, I mean, it, 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 it flies better with me as, as a, you know, kind of mispronunciation of a Yiddish word. Right. And it does. I mean, because it's sort of, it sounds a little, um, It sounds a little like hillbilly, hillbilly, you know, if you, if you put an apostrophe after that N, it mm -hmm. sounds like it's supposed to be, you know, some kind of Americanism hillbilly talk, totally. which doesn't really, doesn't really parse. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks for asking. No word too obscure for us to chase down. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's interesting. I did not know it was a, a one word. I always assumed it was high and then falutin. like spelled high and then falute. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that you mention it, I'd never heard of any low falutin going on. No, so. no. <laughs> or just plain falutin. Mm -hmm. I have a collection of words that only exist in their opposite. Uh-huh. Referred to as my my posit list. 